we think that who we are is what we're into, but who we are is what we do, you know, and what we do is a choice every day. And so we can simulate things and we can think of ourselves, but that's pretty much just being a fan, you know, like you aren't on the field um, or you can do the thing. Um, and so I pride myself on doing the thing. Hi, I'm Jeff Rosenthal, co-founder of Summit, author of Make No Small Plans. And today on Ever Forward Radio, we talk about entrepreneurship, self-care, taking big shots and everything in between. a genius that's how it has to be right like we weren't we were not geniuses we were mm. you know pretty normal dudes so for us by you know thinking in it in, in the framework of like our liberation being bound up together not just with each other but with our community mm. it's like you know i don't know what i need today but i know i can help you yeah um when i find that like stuck point then i have you know an army of homies that want to see me mm. succeed as well how do you how did you get there were you naturally of the give mentality or did you have a great experience with it because i feel like gratitude and oh, gratitude might be a stretch but like being of service on a very mm. regular basis is not second nature for a lot of people you're right and you shouldn't start a community company or like mm. focus on community if it doesn't give you pleasure um i definitely had uh, experience in it. I, I come from a big family. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I would go to these, you know, family dinners every couple of weeks with 70, 80 people, aunts and uncles and my grandparents, like cousins. Dinner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, I was definitely conditioned from a young age to think about this, this extension of family, this idea that like other people that aren't that close to you mm. care about you and want to see you succeed. And so maybe it's a little naive, but that naivete led to like this comfort in, you know, giving without the expectation of return. And we would think about it like the triangulation of goodwill. So mm -hmm. it wasn't about like you returning the favor. That's a game of trades. Mm -hmm. That's a reciprocity loop. We were thinking like, we're going to win the giving competition. This is going to be the most fun interaction you're going to have, you know, all week long. And uh, if we can provide a couple of points yeah. of value for you, then, you know, it really would validate Summit. Like we're building this community of entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. thought leaders of different generations and backgrounds. And what better way to prove it to you versus just tell you about it than to actually make some of those connections on your behalf or hear what you need and what you're working on mm -hmm. or what you want to explore more and then put you in front of a perfect person that could either be a great business partner or a great friend or whatever. Um, so, no, it's certainly in our nature. Uh, and I don't think you can learn it. Yeah. And without yeah. giving away too many of the secrets in the book, make no small, make you no can small give away plans. all the secrets. There's okay, no cool. Secrets. Yeah. Here's the spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, you guys just shot your shot, man. And I think like it was such a good reminder for me of how many instances I've had in my personal life, my journey as an entrepreneur and hell, even still now of yeah. just really somehow some way you just know that this is going to get pulled off but actually how you go about it makes no damn sense so how did you go from like nothing makes sense to a plan to getting people in the fucking room with you there's so many parts to this is it starting the events and the conference series is it buying powder mountain um you know i'd say there's a great brian Eno quote uh mm. once the search is in progress something will be found Ooh, so all yeah, it takes yeah. is like just one step mm. you know in the direction of the thing that you want and if you're comfortable with learning if you're a lifelong learner just to, uh, there's another great quote from the Hagakure, which is like a, a philosophy book mm. of the samurai where they say that only death is the end to shame. Ooh. And so if Ooh. you combine those things, right, Damn. you just go for it. You yeah. want the thing, you know, you want the thing, you start moving in the direction. You don't have to have the answer. You don't have to ever actually get there. Cause if you're shooting for the stars, you can land on the moon, mm. you know? And I think that if you're not thinking about failure as an L, but you're thinking about it as like the, cornerstone that you can build on top of, right? Like all of us had previous startups. We had things that didn't work out. Um, plenty of the projects that we started under summit didn't end up, you know, uh, coming into fruition. But, uh, I think for us, you know, like we always wanted to like bet big, come up with something that was like worthy of our time and our lives and our love and our, and our energy. And, and if it's, if it's big enough, if it's bold enough, then you'll stay with it. If it's like some also ran shit, then you're probably going to quit, you know, or you're going to get, it's like, you know, why am I doing this? Like, 
everything creates stress, everything creates anxiety. So you might as well, you know, utilize, uh, those things for getting something that you really want in your life. There's gotta be something in there that helped you guys get through the aspect of failure of whether it was, we didn't get this guest, we didn't get this venue, we didn't get this money. Um, were you that clear on the, your definition for success for this journey or were you just so committed to, you know what, we're shooting for the stars, so we're going to get the moon. So therefore, yeah. no matter what happens, there's no failure. Well, I'll rewind a little bit. So 2008, um, we're all entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And the first summit event was was 19 people. We were in our tw early 20s, 23, 24 years old, cold calling and Facebook messaging founders of companies we had heard of and convincing <laughs> a couple of them to go skiing with us. And uh, there was no conference. There's no event, really. I don't even know if we had lift tickets. So I think we had like, you know, one twenty four pack of beer kind of thing. Like no, no planning. Yeah. And this was really <laughs> yeah. my partner, Elliot, before myself and our other yeah. co-founders, Brett and Jeremy, were on the map. But, um, you know, the second event, 60 people in Mexico. And that group was really pretty remarkable. There were a bunch of like generationally significant founders and uh, social entrepreneurs meeting for the first time. But even those initial events, just just meeting one another, making one friend who is also an entrepreneur, who's also young and like trying to figure it out. And frankly, we were the youngest and the least experienced people there. So we were immediately the servant leaders. Uh, well, yeah, most true. to gain. And we want to know what you think we should do. Yeah, like, yeah, why yeah. would I rely on my own knowledge? You know, like, yours I'm is new. probably, yeah. I'm new. <laughs> and our third event within the first year of starting Summit was at the Obama White House. Um, right, yeah. So it was Which super- crazy story. You guys got to check that out. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was super exponential. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we had a lot to lose, but we definitely burned the boats. We weren't turning mm -hmm. back. You know what I mean? Like we, we had made our bet. We loved what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We got so much pleasure out of it. We learned so much from it. And truthfully, we valued the friendships that mm -hmm. we were making more than anything else. Um, so, so that was really it. It was like the initial feedback felt so good. They were like, whatever. So mm -hmm. if we like take a big bet, I think, when we chartered the first ocean liner summit at sea, we, we essentially factored the boat. Yeah. So if we didn't sell out, we didn't have the money to cover, right? Like we would have been like, you know, we would have sold a bunch of tickets and then not have actually had the, the ocean liner. Like you literally right? had to burn the boat to get the insurance money to pay. For yeah, well, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> it would have been like, Oh, force majeure. <laughs> Who would have done this? But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you're willing to take those risks yeah. when you're young and you have nothing to lose. And I think that over time, once you build a foundation, mm -hmm. you have more to lose, you have to come from wisdom. You have to make smarter, uh, bets. You can't mm -hmm. just hustle your way into, you know, scale. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it's that initial phase where it's like the very beginning, the zero to one, that's, that's really the name of the game. What kind of external pushback, if any, did you get? Because look, my parents, well, except for my dad, not on, my dad was an entrepreneur after the military, but mm. my mom, my stepmom, my stepdad, I think a lot of people's parents, that generation, it's like, if you're dreaming for this long, you're wasting your time. You're failing. Yeah. How did you get, or did you have any external pushback from family, from other people? Like, okay, cool. You're happy. You're in pursuit of your passion, but like, what are you actually doing? Was there any of that kind of external stress on what you were doing in pursuit of your life stream? I, I'm lucky that my parents just, you know, wanted me to be happy. Mm -hmm. They were like, whatever you want to do, man. Like just, you know, do you. Uh, and there was no real pressure mm -hmm. from a parent being like, you need a real career or whatever. If, if I, when I was like, I'm going to go to law school, they're like, <laughs> okay, sure you are, dude. But when I was like, I have an entrepreneurial yeah, venture. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna throw like you know my co-founder Brett and I yeah. threw co uh, parties in college together. Yeah. So yeah. when I was like, mom and dad, AU. yeah, AU American University. He was at GW, so we were a couple mm -hmm. of DC kids. But when they were like, oh, you and Brett are gonna throw events, that sounds feasible. I can see you doing that. You that go. makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then in terms of just like the feedback from the world around us, I think that, you know, it was really the right idea at the right mm -hmm. time. And some of the people who were early in Summit um, were so foundational in what we ended up building. Tony Shea mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is one who, of course, recently passed away and founder and CEO of Zappos um, and wrote a great book called Delivering Happiness. And he pulled us aside at that White House event. And he was like, guys, um, are there people here who you wouldn't have to your parents' house to be mm -hmm. friends if they didn't have their personal and professional success, would you still like, you know, hang out with them? We're what like, yeah, that? they were like, of course there's some people here we don't want to like kick it with, but that's not the charge. You know, the white house asked us to bring the top young entrepreneurs who are game changer, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, they can't come anymore. Mm. If you're building a community, your culture is your most important thing. And you need to figure out what that culture is and only include people that fit that. 
And now it's 2022, you've heard these words, community, culture, overused so many times, it blew our minds. So we were up until sunrise that night. And that's where we came up with the criteria for Summit. It was one, are these people innovators in their field, regardless of their discipline? And two, are they just open-minded, kind people that we would wanna be around regardless of personal and professional success? So a lot of the times when we would get the pushback, I mean, anybody that's willing to give you critique cares about you and cares about what you're building. You lose them when they say nothing, Mm -hmm. right? Then they just don't care. But if you care enough to tell me how I can be better, and because we were young and because we were hungry, we would take people's advice and we would do it and then we would overdo it. And so when we would come back to you, we'd say, Chase, man, that advice that you gave us was priceless. Thank you for it. And by the way, we even took it further because you're just this like off the cuff for you. You gave me some like, you know, some feedback. You care about it, but it wasn't like yeah. you thought about it for a week. It's not your venture, right? Yeah. So if somebody gives you feedback and then you do the thing and you evolve the thing and you bring it back to them, you're going to get the second, third, fifth, hundred hundredth piece, yeah, piece yeah, of yeah. feedback. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, that really does, that does a lot for what you're in pursuit of, but also like really makes that person feel so much more empowered and heard beyond a way that they probably were originally thinking, because it's like, I, I gave you something off the cuff. Like you said, I gave you an idea, but now you ran with it and made it mm-hmm. better than, you know, you, in your book, you talk about all the time of, uh, over promising, over delivering. Yeah. That kind of being the secret sauce. Yeah, I'm def- definitely. At, to, at a certain point, uh, like today, it's not about over-promising and mm. over-delivering. It's about being excited and scoped mm. and thoughtful and wise in our moves. You know, we have a big platform and we throw one big flagship a year and we have a mountain and we have all the other things that we're involved in, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, whatever. Like, you can hang yourself with the leash if you are in our position and you're still you know, ready, fire, aiming shit. It's just not appropriate. But when you're a startup, when you're at the very beginning and you don't have any resources, like that's really the only way you can like sort of force Mm -hmm. yourself forward. Did I understand you correctly? Uh, Is the whole ready, fire, aim concept, is that not working these days? It's not a matter of not working. It's just like, I wouldn't take that risk. Like when you're, when you're a kid, there's infinite risk. Who cares? Like whatever we lose so you're saying now, like, yeah. like the age you are, like in this kind of and the responsibility. Of the we have investors, we have employees, right, okay. we have, and frankly, you just make smarter decisions when you take a breath mm-hmm. and you're wiser about your moves. I, I think that you know this book and making no small plans and the summit story. It's not like a this is how you should do it story. Mm-hmm. It's just our story. You know, like we were definitely uh, high risk tolerant entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. and you know that could have backfired terribly. But when you're, if you're 26 years old, what career do you have? Like, you know, if you take an L, who cares? Like you can brush yourself off, you can start again. But I think once you have, you know, tens of thousands of people that are part of your community or you have, you know, uh, family and employees Mm -hmm. and all these things, it's just a very different, you know, mathematics as to where you want to end up. So I don't know. I think when you're young, ready, fire, aim all day long, you know, like take all the shots. When you're older and you have some wisdom to fall back on, I think that, you know, hustling has a counter counter effect. But isn't that kind of the like the the driving force, the core component to being an entrepreneur is that just like ready, fire, aim kind of effort mentality because you're betting on yourself really and you know, at this point, mm-hmm. you know, you've proven to yourself so many times that when I do this it may be easy, it may be successful, or it may kind of sting, but ultimately I always figure it out. And so by having that approach, do you think it ever really goes no, away? No, I, I think that the core of entrepreneurship is uh, one, you are afflicted by your ambition to create. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can't not do it. You have to start projects, you have to create art, you have to record podcasts, you have to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's in you and it's innate. And there's people that are totally happy watching like seven hours of football and like kicking it in the park and they are stoked, they're happy. Mm -hmm. I start to like get very restless at the beach, you know what I mean? Like I'm in my zone when I'm building with my friends, it's my favorite part, right? And I'm not a standalone entrepreneur, I'm not like, oh, you know, there are people out there that can do it all by themselves. I need a team like the Equipo is the key mm-hmm. for me. Um, and then I'd say that the second part is that you have to believe in yourself irrationally. Mm-hmm. Um, 
in the sense that, you know, the world exists in a certain way and you believe so much in your idea of it that you think that you can augment the world. You can manipulate reality yeah. to, to be a version of your reality, right? And so that ambition is required, but I think you get into a lot of trouble, especially at scale, if you don't uh, update the playbook. And mm -hmm. just because you ran some Hail Marys, you know, in your early years and you beat a great team doesn't mean that that's going to stand up to the test of time. So true. I, I think wisdom and, you know, reflection and uh, finding the advice of people that have walked the road before you mm -hmm. is really everything. Um, and taking a big enough bet, hence the title of the book. It's like, if it's some, if it's also ran, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to do something really ambitious, even if you're missing, you know, 80% of the tools, I'm like, man, that should exist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help this person refine this idea, or I'm going to provide resources because like, this is a cool idea. This is a big idea and it should exist. And so I think a lot of people bring their strengths. They don't think about what strengths they should have. And, you know, you can, you can, you can make yourself into whatever you want to be. Yeah, you can. And you can do that a lot yeah. <laughs> in this lifetime. You can keep being whoever you want to be. You can be 60 years old, mm -hmm. go to med school and then practice medicine for 20 years. You know what I mean? Like there's no limit. Mm -hmm. So, so does that sound like fun for me? No, like that's not, you know, my path, you know, but anybody's but, grandparent, yeah. they're going to med school at 60. Let me know. I would love I mean, to know. What a gangster. They should be on your podcast, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Would. But all that is to say is that like, I just don't, you know, we we lived it. Like mm -hmm. we were not, we're not Ivy league. We, you know, weren't ordained by, you know, a previous generation to have grand success. Um, you know, I, we say it in the book, but like we, we wouldn't have been your first round draft picks. We would have mm -hmm. been like, you know, if we were in the draft, we would have gotten lucky. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and I think that, you know, it was the right idea at the right time being intergenerational and interdisciplinary in 2008, 2009 until today is, you know, the, the best foundation for, uh, this like, you know, creation that you've seen over the last 10, 15 years, all of the silos of these different businesses are all colliding on uh, into one another now. Like we're all in, you know, we all share so many things in the way that we administer a business and the things that are different from industry to industry, while very specific, that's not what you really need. That's mm. not the answer to the mm. next question that you're trying to solve. Like um, and 20 years ago, it wasn't really like that. You know, Summit wouldn't have made any sense in 1990. Mm. But I think that today it's pretty invaluable. It's like, you know, the breaking of those silos creates the opportunity for these, you know, overlapping uh, wisdoms in these different spaces mm. to connect and then create something exponential. Um, I like the example of vitamin water. Oh, yeah. It's the biggest beverage yeah. for the last like 15 years. Yeah. It's not vitamins and it's not water. It's just a little bit better Gatorade. Yeah. So that incremental jump was actually exponential. So if you can just do something like a little bit better, a new vision and, and build a team around it that really believes you, you can make it happen. Was there ever a moment where like I give up, I'm ready to cash in. Did you ever have any doubt as to what you were doing? Did you lose your why? Did you lose steam? Did you ever think there was going to be a day like, I can't do this anymore? We never lost our why. We never lost steam collectively. And I think that's the benefit of having co-founders mm -hmm. and partners that are, that are talented. Um, you know, if you're the pace car, you're in a lot of trouble. You know, if you have peers, then you can have an off day or week or month and it's all good. You know, your partners can carry that slack. They can carry that weight so for true. you. Yeah. So I certainly had moments where I was down or I didn't have the, the, you know, uh, I didn't have the enthusiasm, uh, but you know, I had great partners that could carry that for me and vice versa when they had to take their, you know, rest and they had to get their moment to, to, you know, reflect and, um, I was there. Right. So I think, uh, it happens to everybody. Nobody just wakes up and is like, I'm having the best day ever. Frankly, it's a bit obnoxious <laughs> if you do operate that way. Everybody has their down days, but uh -huh. like when you have a team, when you have a squad, even if you have peers, it doesn't even need to be your own like partners or co-founders. Like anybody to consult with. Yeah. I think it's more like you're the average of the five people you spend mm -hmm. the most time around. Right. And so like if we're homies and you are an entrepreneur and you're building your thing and I can confide in you and tell you that I'm having like downtime again, like at least just like expanding that and not keeping it bottled up. It starts the process of you getting past it. Yeah. That's a really important concept for people to pick up on. Yeah, man. Um, which takes us back to like the whole aspect. What you're talking about is like the community that you are creating, but also the community that you have along the way. It kind of seems 
I guess it makes sense, but also maybe a little oxymoron. Like I'm trying to build a community in order to do that. I have to have a community already. No, that's, I don't think that's true. Mm. Um, I think that because we certainly didn't and we lost our community. We, we, we took some missteps at Mm -hmm. one point early on in in summit where like the initial group was kind of like, okay guys, good luck. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the key is first and foremost, finding the thing that you're interested and passionate about the, the root of enthusiasm, the Latin root in theos means with God. Right. And if I'm passionate and you're showing up cause it's your job, I'm going to smoke you eventually mm-hmm. because like, this is fun for me and work for you. Mm-hmm. Right. So over time, there's just no way that you're going to be able to keep up. So first and foremost, it's just finding literally whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's Pokemon or Beanie Babies or Web3 or whatever, yeah. man. But if you can really like go that extra uh, level of depth in, when you meet people who are experts in that field, who have dedicated their lives to that thing, and you're insightful, or you can ask insightful questions, it's a fun conversation. I don't care what your level is, mm-hmm. where you're from, your background, what your bank account, doesn't matter. Like you care about the thing I care about. I love community and I love experiential events, right? And I love like surreal, surreal experiential events. Mm-hmm. So you can count the people that do that in the United States on one hand and I'm anything they need from me forever, non-transactional. Cause like it really does drive me. It, it's fantastic to see other people creating things that I look up mm-hmm. to or respect or admire. Um, and so the, the next thing I would say is just, you know, hosting events communities, they require stewards. It requires mm-hmm. somebody to, to start them. So you know how you get invited to the cool party? Throw the party. Throw the party, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we would use the dinner table. You know, yeah. um, I say it in the book, but like the dinner table is one of the greatest pieces of human technology ever created, right? Like what we can do over this thing, the way we can break bread, the way that we can compromise between, you know, disagreeing ideas to find a path forward. Mm-hmm. Now that's a dirty word, but like historically, that's one of the great accomplishments of humanity. And um, we would host these dinners all around the world where we would gather entrepreneurs and innovators and creatives that met that criteria. And it's a lonely road when you're building in that way. And when they would come together, whether we were in Spain or London or New York City or Austin, Texas, it was always the same result where people were like, man, this the vibe is incredible. Yeah. The people are amazing. How do I get more of this, right? So um, that's the steps. It's, you know, find the, find the path and then, you know, meet the people mm-hmm. um, and then just host the gathering. That's it. And, you know, like if you invite 20 people and five say yes, five people at a dinner is plenty of people. You know what I mean? Like Plenty of mouths to feed, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's plenty of conversation. Plenty of conversation. And it's plenty of relationship opportunities. So, like, you know, I just don't think you have to have these grand aspirations or ambitions for community building that will unlock your future. And, frankly, that's an extractive perspective. Mm. You should be getting pleasure out of supporting the people in the space that you're passionate about, about Absolutely. having having the opportunity to be around them in the first place. And so for us, we were always like, man, how lucky are we? Like I get to be a part of this person's journey who I've looked up to, I read their books, and now like they value my contribution. It's not about what I'm extracting or how I'm gonna get you know mine out of it, mm-hmm. right? Like if you do for others in that way, it makes them happy to see you succeed. Couldn't agree more, man. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back to like a point relatively early in the the growth, the scale of Summit that you guys, in my opinion, kind of learned your first harsh lesson of um, we're trying to do this thing with all good intentions and purposes, mm-hmm. but we're also trying to make it a legitimate like a business. Yeah. And talk about the email. Yeah. Yeah. You had some follow up when going from. <laughs> Goodwill to yes. trying to create a business that you kind of got some backlash on. Yes. And I would appreciate to hear like a no, to- lesson totally. in like, taking idea to, to, to scale. So it's 2008. Um, we had hosted our Mexico event and we were planning our Aspen event in 2009. Um, and we, you know, put the first two events on our credit cards essentially. And for Mexico, we got a sponsor to kick in a little bit of money. So it wasn't like a huge loss. But if we were all going to actually like do this for a living, we had to charge for it. And the first two summits were free. So mm-hmm. everybody just, you know, showed up, you know, they had to pay for their plane tickets. And then um, I think maybe the first one, even, with, even the plane tickets Fair were trade. included. But yeah, yeah, just like show up and we'll take care of it. And uh, and so, you know, we sent this email out that was basically like, hey, guys, you know, this is the next summit. Tickets are non-transferable. 
book today. It's $3,000. You know, a, a really poorly chosen Fight Club reference. It was like, it was like, yeah, it was like the rules of Summit are like, don't talk about Summit. <laughs> and the second rule is don't talk about Summit or whatever. So that, of course, made it into Gawker and Valley Wag or whatever. That was, that was, you know, very funny this to be. will self destruct in 30 seconds. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so we, we literally thought we were going to like start just seeing everybody like super excited. Oh man, this is amazing. And we just started getting like angry phone calls and silence frankly most people were just like whatever which kind of stings even more huh? but to be fair you know some of these folks um they they are like luminaries generational luminaries in technology and entrepreneurship who were in those first events we were these like nobody kids that that you know they felt we were getting a very fair trade like they got a free event they brought a lot of their friends and now he here we were trying to like capitalize on their network right yeah. and and had we reached out and said hey everybody this is the situation. We need to figure out how to build a model so Summit can exist long term. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, would love to host a call. Would love to talk to any of you. We could have explained ourselves, and they right. probably would have gotten it. Yeah. Frankly, they probably would have had better ideas for how we would monetize Summit Perhaps. that would have made us a lot richer. Yeah. Frankly, they'd been like start a fund or do it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's probably better ideas on the table, but because we just didn't ask anybody and we just you know were relying on our own mm. brilliance and intellect and hustle and um, you know we really had to start from zero and. Um, you know, we got lucky and we got this White House event in between those two time periods. We, you know, through Mexico clout and like we got to restart the community. Mm -hmm. So now we had another group of 40 people that we had just crushed it for who didn't know of a free summit. Mm -hmm. They knew of, you know, the White House summit. And when we said, hey, by the way, do you and some of your friends who are also qualified want to come to this next event? They were like, of course we do. That last thing you did was amazing. All the people prior to that that were in Mexico with us were kind of like, yeah, see you later. Not everybody. There were right, certainly yeah. some that, you know, rode with us through that period. But um, yeah, the lesson is, man, just like tell people what you're going through, ask them for their advice, and just don't assume mm -hmm. that you have the right idea. There's um, my experience with capitalizing on community for you know financial or business gain, mm -hmm. but I've been in some experiences where like the people themselves, certain people in these a dinner event, a live mm -hmm. event, a meetup, whatever you kind of get the feeling like they're there just to capitalize on the relationships and aren't yeah. really as good intentioned. Maybe. Yeah. So what's your advice for somebody to, to not be a capitalist in yeah. a community? Well, you can feel their hand in your pocket. You, true. Very that's, true. That's yeah. uh, that I love. <laughs> somebody said that about a, uh, a shared business relations. Like, you know what? I talked to him. I can feel his head in my mm. pocket. I thought that was such a great such way to put it. Such a great analogy. Um, yeah. yeah, man. I mean, Visual. look, if, you, if you're being extractive, uh, if you're, if you're thinking about how you are going to capitalize on this relationship, I can see it in your eyes. Mm. I can feel it, man. Like people aren't that even like, you know, unless you're a proper sociopath, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it's pretty clear. Right. And I think that um, when people genuinely enjoy your company, mm. you also know that, and that mm. feels really good. And so, um, you know, I have this this great mentor named Hayes Barner, the founder of Good League, and the way he puts it is he says, life is a giving competition, and I intend to win. And yeah. it's not a game of trades, and it's not a reciprocity loop. It's not about what I can extract from you. Yeah. It's I'm gonna win the giving competition. I'm going to give you more, whether you like it or not. And right? then we all win, really, when you think about That's it. That's right. And, and I think that um, when you score points first before ever asking for anything in return, when it is time and you do need that favor, perhaps that person will give it to you, but you'll also be in a posture where you'll ask the world for the thing that you need. Like I'm always out there making it rain for people, my friends and just people I like or people who I, I think are doing cool stuff. It's, I, I make it rain for people I don't know all the time. Um, but but the reason is, is because it makes me feel good. So I have like a serotonin and dopamine response to the giving. And frankly, if I'm trying to get something from you and it's like a sleight of hand, it feels less good, right? So oh, like yeah, yeah. I'm actually taking something away from myself by trying to extract value. Um, and then, you know, the, the, once you start doing this over time, you either build a reputation as somebody who's always trying to like get for themselves or you get a reputation as somebody that's always trying to do for others. Mm -hmm. And so um, the one thing you need to be careful of, because you asked a question about how to deal with extractive people, but uh, the, the thing that you do need to be careful of if you're a giver is that 
you're always going to be on the heavier balance of giving versus receiving because you get pleasure out of it. You're in practice, right? And you might have best friends who don't share that trait. Yeah. I certainly do. And I used to think that like something was wrong. I would get personally offended if like the reciprocity wasn't matched. And you know, the call out is like, well, then you weren't really in a giving competition. You were trying yeah. to get some shit for yourself. That's so difficult when your expectations, you don't realize you actually do have expectations and they're yeah. short by people. And then it's, yeah, to your point, but, you weren't giving, but you're getting more out of that action perhaps than someone else's. And you just can't apply yeah. your, you know, values or your, you know, chemical reaction to giving or to supporting someone else. Like get the same biochemistry as me. Let's what's Yeah. Like what's about? your problem, man? <laughs> Let's go. Can we like blood dope each other? Yeah. <laughs> um, what has been your biggest revelation since starting summit and kind of seeing this now grow to the level that it is now, um, in terms of the vision that I had in my head is now a reality. Do you feel like you all missed the mark at all? Or do you feel like there's even so much more? Like what has, what has come to life for you the most? I would have bet on all of my friends more. Mm. Like if I look back and I'm like, man, the relevation was just like, holy shit, how successful so many of these people who were early at summit became. And we were, you know, in our mid twenties. Can you share something by the way? I don't think I don't love like name dropping, but like every you name the tech founder yeah. who's under 45 years old and there's a high likelihood they're a part of summit or CPG uh, or nonprofit. Yeah, Tim like, Ferriss was at your first one, right? Tim Ferriss or, oh. you know, the founders of charity water or donors yeah. choose or change.org or, you know, Uber before Uber, or like you kind of name Warby Parker mm -hmm. or you name it. Like they were likely a part of this community because we were all starting. Right. And I'm not 25. I've kind of aged out. Right. And so we have the same existential threat as like, say a previous generation's community would have in terms of relevance for, for a new generation. And so like, if you're an entrepreneur and you're surrounded by other young people building, bet on your friends, man. Cause it's, 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 they're going to win. Like this is the trait that expresses itself. And if it's not on this particular company, it's going to be the second one or the third one. So keep betting on your friends in terms of missing the mark. I mean, we, we would say often this is gardening, not architecture, you know, like, uh, I like that. A lot. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, there's an energy here and we're pruning and we're guiding, but we're not prescriptive as to where it's going to go. Whereas, you know, architecture implies that you have a vision for what this thing will be like. We didn't intend to buy a mountain to build a community. Like none of that stuff was, but, but by the time we made that decision, we were on the hunt because we believe that communities that stand the test of time require roots. And we were still on our blues brothers, gonzo, crazy entrepreneurial journey. And so we thought that it was totally like, we were like, we're going to buy this mountain and we'll be home in LA by, you know, six months from now. Of course, like, you know, 10 years later, it's still grinding, but, um, last words. Yeah, exactly. So I think that you can never predict the means. Mm. It's always way harder than you think it will be. It always takes longer than you think it will. Um, but in terms of just like, you know, missing the mark, I mean, there's no mark to miss. Like mm -hmm. we, it, frankly, I wish there were more things like this. I wish there was more competition for summit, like any other global events that, you know, are like ours or communities like ours, like tell me about them. I'm mm -hmm. in, you know, and in the land of the blind, the one eyed man's king. Oof. So, so like we don't take ourselves too seriously. We know that we're fallible. We screw shit up every single time that, you know, we throw an event or we build a project or whatever. And we try to like minimize those on the next mm -hmm. rotation. But, um, you know, uh, I think that if, if you have this like cherished outcome, if you have this place that you're only trying to get to, mm -hmm. you're never going to get there. But if you understand the principles and you see, sort of like keep, keep the edges a little gray, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I think that is probably mm -hmm. the healthiest way to do it. Yeah. Um, I can relate to that more these days. Uh, living more in the gray is actually developed for me a lot more black and white, if that makes any sense. Kind of like leaving the potential for what could be, or basically, I come from a up, you know, mi even military and mm -hmm. upbringing to where it's like, this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is right, this is wrong. Yeah, not a lot of room for gray. But man, when you get into entrepreneurship or even just creative thinking in general, yeah, like you thrive in the gray. Yeah, so that you can create your your up and down, your right and wrong. Yeah, well, if you think about 
this, it's a hierarchical system, mm -hmm. right? So military is built to, you know, be, you know, command control. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be like, well, are you sure Sergeant? Like I think <laughs> it should be this way. It's like, no, bro, that's not it. I was meditating but about this earlier. This now, this, now the seals, I think it's whatever, 50 million per seal on equipment and training. And mm -hmm. like, they are entrepreneurs. Their job is like, no, you make these decisions in the field and you guys, your, 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 your uh, mandate mm -hmm. is to be flexible, to be able to live in the gray, to deal with the most difficult situations. You also find that at the top, top leadership, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what often happens is that you have like young people who are down to be more flexible um, in an organization. You have like the top tier of leadership who want more flexibility and entrepreneurship and creativity. And then you have everybody that's sort of in the middle of these institutions that, you know, by the nature of the institution, it's institutional. It's supposed to have right. a bunch yeah. of processes to slow us down so we don't, you know, break the value that we've created. So you go from disrupting yourself to maintaining influence or power or capital or whatever, which are just two totally different postures. Well said. Yeah. yeah. What has been maybe some unique protocols you've had in like your, your personal care, you know, cause performing and creating at such a high consistent level, um, you've got to have some kind of things that have helped keep you physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, also at your peak. Totally. Uh, I have a great wife and kids that I recommend to anybody that's thinking about it. Good wife and kids. Partners yeah. are dope. Yeah. Kids are relationships pretty, are dope. Yeah. Relationships, yeah. uh, healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, my children are foreign too. And so that's just been like, you know, an incredible journey and, and, and period of my life this last four years. Um, from the beginning though, like we were all snowboarders and skiers mm -hmm. and surfers and a lot of our events are themed around those things as well. Like yeah. taking people to places where we can do those activities. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a yoga practice for a really long time and had really great teachers. Um, and we had great spiritual practices. We practiced lucid dreaming and transcendental meditation and holotropic breath work. And we actually program a lot of this stuff at summit. So, you know, like you can see we had Ram Dass, we had Eckhart Tolle, we had, um, Jack Kornfield, we've had Brene Brown Damn. as well as Kendrick Lamar, Quentin Tarantino, or, you know, presidents or entrepreneurs or whatever. Um, and then recently I do something called functional patterns, which is this guy, a, dude, it's the, it's the jam. It's a guy named Nadi Aguilar. He uh -huh. lives in uh, Kauai and it's essentially like a decompressive gate cycle training, like weighted workout. And so all the movements are, uh, they're like run, jump, walk movements, but okay. you're, 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 you're focusing on firing the right pattern of muscles. Okay. Um, and so just for me, like as I'm 37, I'm getting older. Um, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, I find it to be incredible. So I, I, um, you know, definitely sh wish I had more of like a constant mental practice. I don't meditate every day. I should, um, I got the sauna in the crib. That's pretty awesome. Ooh, yeah. But, um, you know, massage, exercise, walks, and then, uh, some of the Andrew Huberman, like don't drink your yeah. coffee until 10 AM. <laughs> yeah. And I, I move my workouts. Yeah. I work out now at 11 AM. So I'll do like a morning work session, uh -huh. do the exercise, eat lunch. And then I do it. It for sure works. Like, you're wrong. A lot of his protocols are just yeah. incredible. Yeah. He knows his stuff. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that same bravery that you're talking about as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm like doing that in your spiritual practice and your mental wellness, like really facing the things that you, you know, are trying to avoid perhaps like we all know what they are. We all know where they are. And they're like a little, you know, they're underneath it's the princess and the pea. It's always there. <laughs> um, but I'd say that, you know, we had a lot of success right out the gate and we were like 24, 25 years old and we would have been total shitheads mm. if we didn't have like a humbling practice um, that, that grounded us. I think the original, like, you know, if you're, like the search is in progress, something mm -hmm. that we found the first thing is that right around that time, somebody gave us a copy of be here now by Ram Dass. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're like 24, you know, think we're all that. And then we crack open Ram Dass. We're like, okay, you know, like here we are. But, um, Eckhart Tolle new earth mm -hmm. at that stage is really powerful for us. And, um, yeah, you know, so I guess your answer to answer that it's like yeah. everything all the time, as much as of I can course. get in. Of, I mean, all and, the uh, things, it's yeah. all equally important. But what, what I loved hearing in that answer is really what I didn't hear. Yeah. And there was no, oh, this one thing absolutely is the major contributor to my success mm -hmm. or the, my, my health, my relationships, whatever. I mean, you've, you've committed to such a big process of, 
of life and creation that I would have been surprised to hear if there wasn't also that big scope of commitment yeah. to everything else that you have the, to The realize. one big thing is a voracious hunger for lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And if you can dork out on mm -hmm. everything, then you, you're pretty dangerous, whether it's like food <laughs> or sleep or, or mental wellness. What do you see um, going on in the entrepreneur space right now? Here we are, 2020. Um, 2022, bro. Wow. Wow, I've been asleep for two years. 2022. Um, <laughs> it's the 2020s. The 2020s. Yes. What are we going to call this generation? Yeah. Um, what are you seeing now going on in the entrepreneur space that has you the most excited? Mm -hmm. And where maybe are you the most like confused? Or where is this type of entrepreneurship? Where is yeah. this going? I, uh, far and away, the most exciting space for me personally is the decarbonization of our economy. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be one of the biggest economic movements that we're going to see in our lifetime, not just environmental. Um, and I'm a believer that market-based solutions are really what can scale to change the world to the level that we need it to. Certainly policy and the alleviation of suffering has huge impact mm -hmm. through, through philanthropic means. But if you want to fight the powers mm. that be, the, 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 the major moving tectonic pieces at scale, they typically have a market-based solution, right? So you need to, if you were just negative screening, not investing in negative stuff and, uh, and only investing in like world positive shit, it's not gonna be good enough. We're mm. not gonna make it. We need to replace extractive um, industries. We need to replace pollutive industries with solutions that are both profitable and better for the planet and its people. Do you have um, one that comes to mind? An example. Uh, th there's a huge. There's a whole you know uh, world of this, right? So there's solar. There's battery. There's EV. There's um, there's sustainable home improvement. You know, thirty percent of greenhouse gases here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. come from the home, right? So more efficient windows and doors. This shit seems so innocuous and basic, but it actually has a huge, huge impact. Compounds heavily. Yeah. So so I think that you know that is a gigantic place of innovation. Um, and what's amazing is just like every day you can find like some new, you know, like accidental discovery that can revolutionize the world as we know it. And frankly, there's so much great tech, both in biotech and in life sciences and in, uh, and in energy that never goes anywhere because an entrepreneur never got their hands on it. Like just cause you invented the thing doesn't mean you're going to be able to scale it just cause it's brilliant. Yeah. Doesn't mean that the world will ever see it. Right. So, um, and it's, it's, it's maybe equally hard, right? Because it, it's so difficult to build anything. It doesn't matter what it is. There's three or four years of just like, you know, real, uh, pain and suffering <laughs> and truth. building yeah. and time and like biggest underestimation yeah. of your life. Um, welcomed at the same yeah. time, you know? And I think that look, web three is amazing. I think that, uh, 99% of the stuff that we see today won't be here in five years. However, the Googles and iPhones and, you know, great grand innovations like the Swift um, systems of our time will be built on mm -hmm. these protocols. Um, so we certainly can revolutionize um, the way that we empower people in communities, the way that we govern ourselves, the way that we, you know, um, track capital. So I like, I don't really love the idea of trustless. I like permissionless. Um, there's a couple buzzwords that you'll hear in web three pretty often, often. And, you know, some of them I think aren't that as considerate yeah. and others are absolutely things that can shift the world as we know it. Um, and then, I mean, guys, we just lived through with MRNA vaccines. I don't mean to, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that didn't get vaccinated, all get in the hood, but like to go from not having a vaccine to having vaccines in the marketplace, at the speed that we did, it's unbelievable. Mm. And so if you look at immunization therapy, if you look at like, you know, all these new cancer treatments that are coming online, this is like saving your loved one's mm. life, right? This is saving the planet. This mm. is like, you know, um, and, and these things are so existential and they're so long-term for the most part that like, we just don't typically choose those things to fight for and work on. True. I'd say for Summit though, like that was always our whole philosophy. Like we're like, you know what? We're not the guys that are going to change the world. We're not the greatest entrepreneurs of a generation, but we can be a platform that supports and empowers and creates more um, opportunity for those things to go faster or bigger than they would have without us. And that felt like a real great reason to like do the work that we were doing. Because community is so important to you and so prevalent in your work and something I heavily believe in, I want to take a step further and pick your brain on what about like augmented community when we're getting into the connection between cell phones yeah. and the metaverse and virtual reality. Yeah. Is it possible to still create and to develop to this level in community that's not real? 
Well, not real. Real, yeah. real being real yeah. IRL a versus virtual. Virtual. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I struggle with it personally. Um, I don't build trust virtually. Mm. Like even on Zoom, it's hard for me to like really build rapport and trust in camaraderie oh, and yeah. brotherhood or sisterhood. Same. Right. Yeah. Like you can't get mentored over Zoom or virtually, I imagine you can get mentored on like a function, mm -hmm. but as a human being, one-to-one, -one, it's very difficult to, to break through that third wall. Which is selfishly, actually, why I do my show here, like why, why I do this. Yeah. I, I've done, started off recording in a closet via Zoom window, and yep. like, you know, now in person, it's just like everything you just said comes yeah. to life. Now, there are these barriers for people around the world, mm -hmm. whether you're in a country that doesn't have, you know, as many people that are like you, whatever your affinity group is, you can find it digitally in a way that you never could in real life, right? Very true. Yeah. And um, our affinity group at, at Summit are these intergenerational, interdisciplinary, entrepreneurial thinkers. So there's all of these mm -hmm. uh, positive externalities, right? If you were super into insane clown posse, you could go to the <laughs> Juggalo <laughs> Festival in Minnesota or whatever. ICP. Yeah, well, there's 40,000 people that are into the same terrible music that you're into, which is all good. That's fantastic. Like you can find your community, right? Yeah, so absolutely. I think that the, the moment that we're in is empowering more and more people to find their community, mm -hmm. to find their interests, to find their people, which is a amazing. I think that the depth that you can get to virtually, like you can't break bread like you would around a table. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to spend three hours like hanging out and chopping it up mm -hmm. and sharing stories or whatever. It's just, and perhaps some people do. And if they enjoy that, fantastic. Um, but I do think the the, the, the real power combo is going to be when these online communities that are thoughtfully gathered based on shared interest and values mm -hmm. start deploying and gathering in person. And what, what often does happen, like I've heard this a number of times from like, you know, friends of mine who are in the board ape community, um, they bought board ape NFTs and they went to NFT NYC and they met up with all the other board apes in person. And they were like, I don't think I'm a board eight. You're not my dude. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> yeah, is yeah, just, yeah. Not, it's not the same thing. Like mm -hmm. we all, you know, invested in this thing. We're all having fun with this asset. We all have certain shared values, but that's not the, that's not the foundation it's of community. Full representation. And, yeah. and it will be. Yeah. Um, remember we're in chapter 0.1 mm -hmm. of all this stuff. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm curious what Tim Sweeney would say from like, you know, Epic games, uh, and, and Fortnite, you know, mm -hmm. like the real visionaries on this stuff. I'm sure they have aspects of it figured out that, that we haven't thought of yet. What would be your advice to, for someone to do that? Like, let's say maybe the community in real life is not as realistic in a certain timeline as getting access to, Hey, we're going to meet on zoom. We're going to do Fortnite chat, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, what would be your advice to go from virtual to in real life as scalable, as safely, as realistic as possible to like, because yeah. we know what's on the other side of real life. If we're all over the world, then it's not realistic that we're going to gather in person. Mm -hmm. If you're in Bahrain and I'm in, you know, and I'm in Australia, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to quarterly get together and, and break bread. Right. Um, but if, if you have like a, a thriving digital community, mm -hmm. I, I think that, you probably can often, it would be like going on a date night with your wife, mm -hmm. right? Like it's easy to not do it, right? Like over a certain amount of time, especially if kids and you're working and it's travel and it's like two weeks goes to three weeks and now it's been a month and you haven't had a night together just to not do anything mm -hmm. but be in relationship, right? Um, I think that people need to prioritize being in person with one another. I think that if this pandemic and all of us being in our houses showed us anything, like it's how much we need each other. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, from an even higher level, the greatest punishment we have in our society is removing people from our communities, Isolation. right? Yeah. yeah. And the greatest gift is including them, introducing them to our families and our best friends and spending time. It's the thing we'll never get back, right? Um, so I, I would say that, you know, as we move into this new era of digital first friends, mm -hmm. Um, you know, making sure that if it's really important to you and you really do want to develop deep bonds with these people, you got to go and, and prioritize mm -hmm. seeing each other in person. Have you had any unique spinoffs? I'll say from, we'll say, you know, summit series or like your main thing mm -hmm. and, and entrepreneurship I found personally, like I've got my main thing and my main yeah. thing is constantly staying in pursuit of being a student and just what lights me up and what optimizes me, mind, body, and soul. And then when I have a unique realization, I create an offshoot, you know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do an offer about this, a post about that, a podcast here, yeah. uh, a, a video there kind of thing. Yeah. Um, is that a part of the journey as well? Or do you think because 
we have so many options in different platforms now to have offshoots of a remain thing as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. we become diluted, we become distracted. We certainly become distracted and deluded. And even those that can multitask can't multitask. Like you can multitask, but multitask there is, is a, a lie. Yeah, yeah. There's a drop off in, mm -hmm. in your capacity on whatever it is that you're focusing on. Right. Like you, you, even if you are talented at it, it still has a negative effect. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that Summit as a platform is just such a great gift for us to explore all these different, I want to be a better entrepreneur and a business executive. The relationships are there. I want to you know, really get better about life sciences and my own physical health. The relationships are right there. Um, I really want to get more involved in philanthropy and impact and you know, giving back and politics. All of those people are also part of our community, right? So not all, but many of them and many really brilliant people in all of these different disciplines. So it allows for us to just sort of, you know, pick from the tree of knowledge. And we haven't really started that many offshoots, to be honest with you, um, primarily because like we bit off more than we could chew. And then we had to like figure out how to chew it. And that, so that was the quote I was thinking of yeah. earlier from Alex. Uh, yeah. He got that. That was the line of advice he got from, I think Elliot yeah. about bite off more than you can chew and figure figure out how to swallow it later. Yeah. Yeah. It later kind of thing. Yeah. And, but that also means that you have to catch up. Right. And mm. often the hype that'll come with your scaling and your speed of scaling creates new opportunities for even more opportunities. And in a lot of people are like, Oh, okay. Yes, 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 mm. yes, yes. For us, we, especially in the pandemic, we really battened down the hatches, got very focused on the business lines that we're already in, on the vehicles and the, or in the institutions Detroit. that we already have built that really needed more of our time and attention and love. Um, and, you know, we also don't really count chips. So like if somebody inside of Summit spins something off or meets their partner at Summit or they build something, we're not like, hey, where's our piece? And you won't hear me talking about it on this podcast. You won't read about it in a, in a, in a magazine. Like that's their business. Um, and so again, it goes back to that not being transactional piece. Mm -hmm. Like we want to see our friends and our coworkers spin things off of this platform and go and kill it, you know, and we don't need a piece of it. Right, yeah. um, because again, it validates the reality of this platform being catalytic. Um, what didn't make it in the book, man? Cause oh, there are so of, many a lot of stuff. None of the bad stories. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's a very, it's a very, I mean, there was PG 13, man. So much in there no. that I'm just like, wow, 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 wow. Yeah, no. Like take us back to one thing that you can or want to share that didn't make it in there. That is still an instrumental part of your journey. Yeah. That the, the new or scaling entrepreneur now needs to hear so they can know that, like, I'm not alone. I don't know if I have that. Like, look, this is about our journey from 2008 to 2013. Mm. So it's from the very, very beginning. It's five years. And it's from when we started Summit to buying Powder Mountain. And that's eight years ago now, mm. seven plus years ago now. Right. So a lot has happened in between those in those timelines. Right. And, um, you know, one of the things that didn't make it in the book that like, just for, I guess my ego wanted it was summit outside. We threw this event. Um, and, and I don't have like a, like a incredible piece of wisdom for the, you know, no, up and coming entrepreneurs. But, um, so we had bought powder mountain and this was sort of the end of our confirmation bias. Also, it's the greatest event we ever threw and the biggest sort of like shit show we ever made for ourselves. Um, it's funny and, how those yeah. things often go hand in hand. So we know. buy powder mountain, we sign the docs, we raise the money, mm. we've bought the mountain, the books over and we're like, man, we got to throw our first event and you can only throw your coming out party one time. True. Right. And, um, you know, there's a great story in the book about how we first brought people to Powder Mountain on the back of one of our other events. We like, you know, had a, we were like, go to the bus and we took them to the airport and there was an unmarked gate and then we had our own 737 and we took them up on top of the mountain. Like we're, this is our, this is our art form, right? Like we're gonna really, see Hank, he's going to take you to the BK lounge it, after that. Yeah. <laughs> like we, but this is really like, it's important to us because the narrative of your experience mm. creates a lot of like the memory of the thing and, oh, yeah. and, and what makes it special is often these like surprises and delights. So mm. a, a great quote in the book also is, uh, my buddy, Michael Hebb, who kind of invented the pop-up dinner as we know it. Mm. Um, he was like, Hey man, do you keep it real? And I was like, yeah, bro, of course I keep it real. It's like, don't do that, dude. You got to keep it surreal. You got to go just a little bit beyond people's expectations and imagination. So trick question back to the, back to the story. We buy powder mountain and we're like, let's throw our first event this summer. There's still snow on the ground. So we're like on snowmobiles cruising around on top of the mountain, planning like where we're going to put the campsites yeah. and the sprung structures for the dining halls and the main stages. Um, and over 90 days 
we built out an event on top of this mountain with no infrastructure for a thousand people. So like wow. hundreds of tents and domes and teepees, everything you could rent. And then we bought our own stuff. Uh, we, we mulched and cut 18 miles of trails. We, uh, built like a giant pool on top of the mountain, like a huge natural oh, pool. Um, we built six like sprung structure restaurants and like hanging, like, you know, like, uh, trampolines covered in like pillows and the trees. Damn. There were like kegs that we dropped into the trees. So you'd like, you know, pull a tap out of like, That's there so was, dope. <laughs> yeah, there was a gamelan, uh, uh, a gamelan is like, uh, gongs and okay. it's like in, in, uh, in different symbols that were on, uh, with, with little, uh, I'm not technical, but there's like, uh, they had like, um, each one had like a little chip. And so it was all controlled from a computer. And so it would play like sort of a symphony oh, wow. of these gongs in the woods, in wow. the forest, um, just over the top. Like it's far and away the best event we ever threw, in my opinion. And the paint was still drying when people got there. And it lost a lot of money. Like we were in the, he's so excited about this. He's like, he's like, Oh shit. I didn't see that coming. So like we thought we'd lose like lost so much. No, money. we thought we'd lose a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. We ended up losing considerably more than we thought we mm -hmm. would. Right. Just cause we, everything was rushed. Every, every invoice was more. Mm -hmm. Um, we hired, I think 950 people for a thousand person event. We were getting temp staff from agencies that were coming like straight out of prison in Salt Lake Whoa. city. And like, you know, there were like fights and so it was crazy. Um, but to every attendee that was there, Damn. Flawless. They just. Wait, are you talking you know, about Fire, Fire Island by chance? It could have been. <laughs> oh man, there was one. So there's a moment. So we're setting <laughs> up the tents. This is this is like the worst moment and the most hilarious. So we're setting up the tents. We have like these huge lights on top of the mountain. It's like us and the Army Corps of Engineers would have mm -hmm. like pulled this off. And the Fire Festival move would have just been like whatever. Who cares? Sell them something that doesn't exist, and we'll let God sort it out. And of course, you saw how that worked. We took the pain mm -hmm. and we took the financial hardship and made sure that all of our community had the most incredible time ever. I respect nothing less um, at this point. But, but it's like the day before and we have 18 wheelers on top of the mountain that our team's driving like four in the morning. It starts raining. We have the floodlights over the whole campus and we had to put in um, the rugs and then the beds and then the mattresses on top of the beds and uh, in 500 tents we forgot to put the rugs down. And so here we were like time is running out, right? Like people are showing up and we had to take out all the beds from all the tents with our ten tents from five more. It was frankly more. It was, it was like for 900 people. So yeah. I think we had pretty much finished and we were like, Oh shit, we never put the rugs down. And so there's two decisions. It's like, do you just leave it without rugs? And they were like, Oh man, but we charged like a lot of money for people to come and like, you know, camp out in this glamping experience. So we're going to deliver it. Right. Um, and so long story short, it's like, that was, that was probably the greatest gift. One, it was like huge for powder mountain mm -hmm. and we sold tens of millions of dollars of real estate from that investment that we put into this wow. event. Wow. We thought we would, you know, come closer to breaking even, but ultimately it was like very much mm -hmm. a highly valuable thing that we did. Um, but that death of our confirmation bias, that was so important because like you read this book and you're like, Oh, win, a win, a win, a huge win, another win. And it's like, yeah, we're geniuses. We can do anything. And then having that like real punch in the face, it was like, Whoa. Okay. So like we can absolutely screw up. And, uh, you know, we lost great people. There was, there were, there were partners and employees that like didn't get their bonus for the first time because wow, of that, wow. that year. Right. And like, you know, it just changed the call. And that, that's when you ask about like ready, fire, aim versus like strategy and wisdom, that was the moment. Cause we thought that this, like, you know, like, uh, I, I use the term like blues brothers, like where it's on the mission from God and you're just like, whatever, where are we going? Who cares? Get in the car. It's going to be magical. That shit runs out, you know? And this was the moment about eight years ago where we learned that lesson without it being like a mortal issue. Um, but you know, I think everybody has to go through one of those, um, on the way mm -hmm. up. Um, man, I, uh, I was just so enthralled by your story and what you and the whole team at summit have done and are doing. So I just want to like acknowledge that work, Thanks, man. that journey. Um, I can't, Im I can imagine that writing this book and kind of reliving it was probably both equally fun and, you know, maybe stings a little no, bit. It was all was it? fun. It was okay, all good, fun. Good, good, good. It was so great. Cause it was also like, you know, my, my co-founders and I, we mm -hmm. all like, you know, we have kids and we, you know, like run different parts of the business now. And so like, it's not like 
shoulder to shoulder like right, it was yeah. during this time period. So for us all to be able to like, you know, one, have an excuse to chat every day and <laughs> two, just to relive these things and, and remember these stories. And frankly, like yeah. you would have a different experience at an event than I would. Right. Mm. So there's things that happened that I didn't know about True. that, oh, yeah. you know, came to the surface in, in the book. Um, through this process. It was, it was super fun. Well, it, it was, it was a lot of fun to read, a lot of fun to, uh, to experience. And it was even more fun for me and well, the audience at this point now, uh, you know, recently, by the time this comes out, we had Alex Benayan on the show mm -hmm. who we got a whole other kind of perspective, at least from the beginning with his involvement and yeah. under the mentorship of you guys. Um, so it's been a great full circle kind of experience. Well, when he's 19 and Elliot's 23, Elliot seems like a together yeah, oh, yeah. legend. Whereas yeah. when you looked at, from our perspective, looking <laughs> up, we were like the least experienced, <laughs> goofiest goofballs. And so I'm very happy that it worked mm -hmm. out for Alex and worked out for us. And he's the man, of course. And yeah, he's doing great. You know, you know, that book is huge in Japan. Huge the, in Japan. The really third door for a time was like uh, like one of the best selling books in Japan. Still wow. is a huge. It's like wow. a. I know a real like international bestseller was yeah. kind of like the big thing all over. Proper like, phenomenon in wow. Japan. Oh Damn. yeah. Oh yeah. Damn! Shout out Alex in Japan. Yeah. I wonder, yeah. I wonder if third door is. I wonder if that's like another. Is there another meaning? That, uh, in Japanese? Uh, no, I think it's more just like if you think about it from a societal perspective. In the mm. third door, the idea is like, you know, uh, there's the front door, there's the back door, and then like you can figure something out mm. and find some sort of like off angle way to get in front of the people that you want to get in front of, right? To, to find the answers to the questions that you're seeking. There's always a way. Yeah. As he says. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. And, uh, and, and having fun with that, not mm -hmm. being like, Oh, how am I going to get this? Thing? I can't figure it. It's like, no, we're going to figure this out. And, mm -hmm. and I love the crazy idea of brainstorming where it's like, you just try to throw out the stupidest, craziest, funniest thing. And eventually something in that Venn diagram yeah. is close enough to reality where you're like, maybe we should buy a mountain. Maybe we should charter an ocean liner. But I think that, you know, we talked about hierarchical, mm -hmm. um, organizations. I'd say that Japan is a pretty formal society comparatively. And so yeah. the idea that you would just like, you know, uh, you know, dress up as a Uber eats person with cupcakes to show up in the office mm -hmm. so you could get your resume to the person that's like unheard of and Probably crazy like a fantasy story to them yeah you know? yeah it's so not I, normal at all. all of his stories are just like insane but yeah. it's like huh wow you can connect with this person that you want this thing on this other mm -hmm. platform and that can unlock the value that you're seeking um i think was super novel yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and in your story, you guys definitely got me thinking more and thinking bigger. And it was a great validator for me of all the big thinking that I do have to just know that like, okay, big thinking, crazy thinking, communal thinking is really, I've always believed the secret sauce for just passion and purpose co really coming together. And mm -hmm. so to hear and see that from so many other great people is just like, you know, a big thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. And, and the world is set up to shut down big ideas mm -hmm. with good reason. You know, like we only celebrate Steve jobs, the rebel after he's successful until then he's a heretic, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we constantly, when we hear things that are too outside the box, we, our first reaction is like, bro, just mm -hmm. try that. But like 50% of that. Mm -hmm. So it's really mm -hmm. actually attainable. And that's, frankly, bad advice when you're starting out because you need people around you that will help you take your passion and your purpose and your bad idea and move it into like a feasible idea. Not so bad idea. Right yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. It's Maybe like a good idea. The but that, that's the point though. It's like nothing ever comes out and it's mm -hmm. just genius. And like all of the, all of the routes are figured out. You have like the, you have like the, you scratch the surface. It's, and it, and it comes into view as you get closer and closer to the thing, as you do the work around mm -hmm. the concept, whether that's music or art or, I mean, I, can, I can't tell you how many people I heard 12 years ago when we started this journey. I was like, okay, dude, you're an okay singer songwriter, but like, you're, I mean, this person's not gonna, and then you hear them today, 12 years in the yeah. game, and they are fantastic. Of course they are, they've been at this for 12 years. They never gave up. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, they were like the young, and that was the same with us. People probably dismissed us as soon as they met us. They're like these goofy kids and their event or whatever. And then they like me now. Anywhere. I mean, they like us just fine because mm -hmm. we're the same people. Like we, we, we agree. We were like, yeah, this shouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, you would still, that was the right reaction. But, um, but you know, that's, that's the key. I, there was this, uh, there was a, a hard knocks with Chad Ochocinco. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot it. Cause he was like, bro, three years, four years, pro bowl or two, 
get out of here, man. Come and talk to me on season like 16, 17, you know? And this is an infinite game, mm. whether it's education or impact or entrepreneurship or relationships, this, this game never ends. There's no whistle, mm. right? So the true players, the people who have the most wind wisdom, they've been in this for three, four, five decades. And uh, I don't know, that's, that's the part for me that's so exciting is that there's always, you know, a next piece of wisdom that you can unlock. There is, man. And so uh, actually, I want to unlock one more piece of wisdom from you, if I could. Okay. Uh, my last question for all my guests is to kind of bring it home to the theme of living a life ever forward. Yeah. It's just to kind of bring attention and awareness into just one thing in our life, our business, our wellness, our relationships that can just help us take a step or any next step forward. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? How do you live a life ever forward? How do those words fall on you today? Today, it's interesting. Two and a half, three years ago, we had built Summit as you know owner operators. Mm -hmm. uh, we had started nonprofits and worked with great you know impact organizations and felt really proud of that work. I didn't feel like I was a talented executive though. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had like a you know some startup experience or whatever. But I, I have peers that are like rock stars, and so I really committed for years now to figure out how I could really be of service and of value to my friends as, they, as they've continued to elevate, right? And now I feel like that cup's pretty full. Mm -hmm. And now I realize that I don't do as much stuff that I just truly, like the creative aspects of my life, right? So today I'm trying to create the space for you know the things that are gonna make me happiest and gonna drive mm -hmm. um, my like creative muscles. And that could be inside a summit or outside a summit. Um, and I think that always being sensitive to what you need today, not yesterday, is the key. Mm. And you know, uh, I, I, I that changes for me over I time. Like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I feel like it's health and mental health. Sometimes I feel like it's family time. What I don't do is I don't get into a cycle of like beating myself up over something where it's like, oh man, I should have done this or I should do that. I miss this person. I'm not, I don't show up for, you know what I do? I call the person mm -hmm. or I, I grow in the space and I dedicate the time, um, Hell to yeah. actually exploring it and actually spending time on it. So we think that who we are is what we're into, mm -hmm. but who we are is what we do, you know, and what we do is a choice every day. And so we can simulate things and we can think of ourselves, but that's pretty much just being a fan, mm -hmm. you know, like you aren't on the field, um, or you can do the thing. Um, and so I pride myself on doing the thing. So I love that answer, man. I, I kind of brings to life for me this, you know, concept of you're saying of, I, I don't like maybe who I am right now. I should have done this, should have done that. should have contacted this person so much of who we could be. And I'll even say like who we actually really are. It's yeah. just one decision away. There's yeah. One, like just one small piece of action can take us from who we think we might be now to okay. showing us who we actually really are. And it's so simple to your whole point of just tapping into your community, creating that community, being the community for maybe even another person along the way. And it becomes easy once you're in practice, mm -hmm. once that's the groove that it you build. It becomes your norm. norm. Exactly. Yeah. But at first it takes bravery. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first event I went to with Elliot Biznow, mm -hmm. my co-founder, was a charity water event, a gala. I was like 22 or 23. I'd never been to any events. I'd never been to anything cool or course, entrepreneurial or whatever. Yeah. And I, I remember I called my girlfriend at the time and I was, I walked out. I was like, I don't, I don't fit in here. I can't like hold a conversation with anybody. I'm like, you know, really not like yeah. capable, like kind of a, like it just kind of felt like a loser. It's like mm -hmm. everybody was so cool or fancy and confident and they're all building stuff already. And like, there, I was yeah. just kind of a nobody. And, you know, everybody who's anybody was a nobody at some point. And, uh, you know, I think that just all it takes is that one opportunity, that one conversation. And I remember like there were two or three people that were there who like found me interesting, mm -hmm. who enjoyed talking to me. Of course. <laughs> and that, that was all it took. And yeah. then I felt like, oh, wow, okay, I can hang. I can mm -hmm. be here. I do belong. Um, so, you know, just stay in it, man. Even when mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable, if you think you're doing the thing that you're meant to do, or if it's something that you love, just stay in it. And uh, make no small plans along the way. You guys definitely want to check out this book. Um, a lot of fun, a lot of enjoyment, a lot of laughter. Um, and a lot of, like I said, for me and any other creative or aspiring or 
actual entrepreneur, just anybody who knows that they're capable of more, doing more, creating more, connecting more. Like this is just another great example of other people out there doing the same thing. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Dude, Jeff, thanks so much, man. I'll wrap the interview there. Thank you.